I think I'm going to kick off um, in the traditional Oxford form. We always start five minutes later than the advertised time. Um, for those of you that don't know me, which is lots of you, which is very exciting, actually, um, I'm Vicky Nash. I'm a policy and research fellow here at the OII. I'm deputy director, and I do lots of our sort of outward-facing work. Um, and I'm really delighted to introduce to you our speaker today, um, whose biography I've just forgotten to bring with me. But the things that I picked out from it when I read it earlier um, were just a sort of a really impressive array of talents. So obviously, yes, journalism, book writer, you already know. Um, game designer, avid gamer, I presume. Uh, public speaker, you've done TEDx, I gather. Um, TED? TED. Sorry. <laughs> Get it right. I've done both. <laughs> <laughs> um, TV programs, radio, print journalism, you name it, you've done it. Lots of good speeches. So, yes, um, we're going to spend uh, the next hour and a quarter or so having a chat. I will probably talk to you for hopefully about sort of half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, you'll see that we have our fine cameraman at the back, Arthur. We're basically going to re record the first part. We will aim not to sort of record and, and broadcast your questions after, but if we have any interjections, obviously along the way, just be aware that that would probably be included in the webcast and don't stand up and swear or offend the Queen or anything like that. That'd be great. Okay. So, looking at your publication list, the last sort of few books and journal articles and sorry, newspaper articles and things like that, it's quite clear that you've got a really strong interest in all things digital. And I just wonder, you know, where did that come from? How did you start out on this course? So it all began in Oxford, oh, uh, as everything marvellous did. So I, I was a geek from when I was very young. I, I, I was of a sort of generation that just had BBC Micros at home, which was very exciting for me because I got to print Hello um, many thousands of times and things like that. But I, I came here to study English. And I went on to do a uh, sort of master's and a doctorate, sort of crossing over between literature and philosophy. But I was also a, a geek, and I played games, and I did coding, and I collaborated with people who were starting tech companies. And I was very, in a sense, bothered by the fact that all the sort of l everything I cared about in the world of ideas and culture um, was, it was obvious, and this is in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, becoming mediated by and through technology. You know, sort of this was, you know, the digital realm or realms becoming the, the home of culture, becoming the dissemination, the discussion, and so on, and so on. And yet, you know, there didn't seem to be much common ground or fruitful discussion between, on the one hand, the, the, the literati, and on the other hand, the geekerati. Um, and I found this very depressing because, you know, if you care about ideas, you want there to be, you know, sort of as rich an exchange between them as possible. And so I sort of almost accidentally found myself filling that niche. And I, I having done my doctorate and done a bit of teaching, I, I went to London to, to sort of write and to try and be involved in where new things were being said. And I found myself writing about video games as a way of writing about people's relationships with and through machines. Games always struck me as, in one sense, a sort of a slightly prophetic realm of interaction because they are, you know, they're hedonic. Or to put it another way, um, if you're not having fun, you very quickly stop playing. They're a very kind of pure and difficult test of engaging people. Um, and I wrote about the psychology of games, and I, and I worked on some games, and I was very, very interested in, you know, how to try and mix the old and new fruitfully. And I've consistently found that other a surprisingly few people seem interested in this in what to me is an interesting way. So there's plenty of talks that begin with a kind of a hand wave Gutenberg, maybe a few flint tools, and a vague gesture in the direction of parts of the brain that someone's just looked up on Wikipedia. And then they've done human nature and history, and it's on to why Twitter is the best. Um, and I wanted to have a lovingly critical relationship with technology, I guess. And so I've tried. And I don't know whether I've succeeded or not, but I've tried to be in a position where I can write about it and work with tech firms and work on products and try and sort of conduct what for me is a very interesting negotiation about you know, what it means to use technology well, to live with it well, and to describe um, you know, sort of how we're using it in terms that aren't totally denuded of historical or philosophical or even sort of artistic or literary context. It's a very Sorry. long answer. All my answers <laughs> went with this one. Which is it's quite all right. I only had to ask three questions, don't mind. Um, you, lovingly critical, I mean, that's a really nice way of putting this. I think it's certainly clear from, from, from a lot of your work that you, 
you sort of embrace technology with with an equal amount of maybe sort of you know fascination and trepidation. You know, you're not you're not one of those. You know, we, we see them those great utopians who think you know the internet changed everything for the better and isn't life wonderful. You seem very aware of of both you know sort of positive and negative potential, often of course, which go together. Let, I, I'd be interested in talking about that a bit more, and I wondered maybe if we could just start with some of the work that you've done o on gaming specifically. And now, um, it seemed to me that you, you clearly don't think that we take gaming seriously enough. Can you can you just expand on on that a bit? So, I believe in taking games seriously, partly because it seems to me that that games and play more generally are really you know quite a dominant model in how we relate to technology. That you know user experience design in some senses overlaps very heavily with with the idea of play um, i'm not trying to sort of totally erase distinctions here but you know making so i once described games and i'm sure i wasn't the first person to do it as an extraordinary species of reverse engineering we evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to find certain things stimulating and engaging um, obviously, you know, learning is, is a big aspect and symbolic learning and the construction of shared symbolic means of, of, in a sense, allowing learning to be cumulative rather than just die with the individual, otherwise known as language. That's a pretty big deal in any account of, well, what's special about humans. And now we are, in a sense, building other worlds, building little environments, expressly designed to tick our evolutionary boxes, to keep people engaged, playing, clicking, to serve up. And I'm not going to go into kind of neuro babble here, because uh, I find it very depressing that someone sort of mentions dopamine on a stage, and then they have the mantle of science uh, clothing their fairly pedestrian observations about the fact that, big surprise, we think with our brains, and our brains change when we think about something a lot. But I think, so gaming for me is profoundly double-edged. It's partly autobiographical that I have found sort of in games astonishingly interesting experiences, you know, trying to describe interactive art forms, if you like, and these sort of social, these miniature worlds into which you go and interact with other people and do other things. Um, and I found this increasingly sort of, a lot of successful social media services, websites seem to me to, if you like, kind of gamify other elements of our life. Uh, kind of horrible word there, but you take very hard, intractable human problems, and in a sense, you conjure up easier, toy-like, playable versions of them. And this, is, this gets to the heart of something in tech for me. There's a lovely saying from Daniel Kahneman, who, who uh, the, the Nobel laureate for psychology, uh, or economics, I suppose, for his contributions in behavioral economics. And he says that when faced with a difficult problem, we often substitute an easier question instead, often without noticing the substitution. And this is how we solve problems. This is how we, in a sense, model the world and make astonishing progress. But this is also, in a way, how we make a very dangerous switcheroo. So difficult question, am I loved? Do you like me? That's pretty agonizing. Easy question. Do you want to click like on this? Are you my friend online? A difficult question. How many friends do I have? Easy question. How many friends do I have? And so on and so on. And so I'm interested, when I think about technology as powerful, as empowering, but at the same time as having this great threat that there is a speciousness to the opportunities it offers, I come back again and again to the psychology of sort of play and of pleasure and of engagement to the casino-like dynamics of social media or Candy Crush, but to the, you know, the expressive potential of places like, of sandboxes like Minecraft, to, and I don't have a resolution on this, but I've tried to, I was very interested in World of Warcraft, I played it from when it came out. I made a lot of friends in it, it was an interesting social arena, and some of the people I met said it's a role-playing game, and that's awesome because in my life, I am uh, an overweight man living in Gaston County, South Carolina, famed for diddly squat. Whereas in this game, I have a role to play. I am a tank. Um, and there is a thing I do, like in a game of football, or American football, or rugby. And it is a shortcut to meeting people. We go, we play together. And then we talk about other stuff. We talk about Mark Twain. We talk about politics, we talk trash, 
but you know we are in a sense door, doors are opened and we begin to interact and so I'm circling around something here I think perhaps too elusively but for me the the driving force of sort of of kind of of making things fun, of making things engaging, of translating our world into the screen world in a way that is compelling slash profitable slash empowering, it seems to me, you know, an extraordinarily important set of questions. How do you make sure that these freedoms and connections are not specious or spurious? How do you make sure that they aren't just a distraction from dynamics of power or profit elsewhere? But also, how do you celebrate some of the quite astonishing facts that come with this, that come with most of humanity beginning to be, in a small way, active participants in the thing we call written, recorded, symbolic culture, when, broadly speaking, for all of human history, until the last 50 or 60 years, culture, permanent words, this is stuff that was done by a very small number of people on behalf of the many, whose story was that of darkness and silence? That was an even longer answer. <laughs> it's dangerously good questions. Sorry. <laughs> dangerously good answers, I think. I'd counter with that. Um, I, I, I'm struggling to know which particular nugget to pick out of it, but let's, let's maybe start with, let's start with one thing you mentioned quite early on, which is this, this horrible word, you and I both dislike, you know, gamification. Now, um, you know, this is regarded, I think, isn't it, with sort of, with some excitement across numerous sectors ranging, ranging from, you know, education, uh, you know, sort of the, the military, um, medicine, and for precisely the reason that you gave, which is that if you can harness that, the, the, the power of, of, of these tools to make something compelling and rewarding and fun, you can maybe get people to, uh, you know, have more of their sort of proverbial spinach, if you like, you know, you're sugaring the pill in some way. Now, um, I, I find it hard to see what your view is on that, because on the one hand, you, you, know, you depict it so beautifully, and yet on the other hand, I also see you particularly in, you know, sort of the more recent books, you know, like, like Live This Book, saying, oh, well, actually, hang on a minute here, you know, those, 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 li those difficult things in life, like working out who your friends are or working out, you know, who loves you, um, doing, doing maths in school on a piece of paper, which might be harder and less fun than doing it on an iPad, those are sort of necessary. So, yeah, where do you, uh, where do you stand on game? Yeah, so, so this is where I get to do articulate ambivalence again. Oh, but great. I... Fall off my chair trying to put the air conditioning the word is why The word is a problem for me because it falsely suggests that there is a thing that games do that is easy to do and understand and you can bottle it or schematize it and then sell it to people as an engagement layer to be implied to whatever and that will make it awesome and it will just provide a sort of potent extrinsic motivation profit. Um, I still get emails. I did a sort of, I, I, I wouldn't say I helped found the field, but I think I did a talk at a, at a moment when people were becoming interested in this and still have people writing to me effectively saying, could you help me gamify this? Or, or, or you know, are you Mr. Gamification person? To which the answer is, I'm not. Uh, go away. Although the easy answer might be, please give me some money. And <laughs> but, 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 the thing I come back to is that systems of extrinsic motivation are necessary and everywhere, and sometimes they're rubbish. Grading in exams in schools from a early age up I think is, is deeply flawed. It's a system of, it's a measurement, of course. It's, it, it attempts to come up with, if you like, fair uh, metrics by which we can see how people are doing. And there's an element of motivation in there as well. As far as I can tell, you know, it's largely governed by momentum and by the laudable but sort of very uh, retrograde desire to be sort of scrupulously fair in the sense of sort of metrically verifiable. It doesn't really take into account the psychology of the last 50 years, let alone the last 20 years, let alone the last, you know, in terms of, well, what is motivating and empowering and interesting and exciting for these poor little blighters? Um, and, you know, so I am all for trying to come up with sort of better and richer systems of measurement 
and extrinsic motivation, then I think we need them. My favorite Willie Allen quote from among many is 90% of success is showing up. And you know, if people don't show up, they are absolutely guaranteed to fail. That's one of the few certainties. And I have seen in schools and with things like games and so on that you can, so to speak, get people showing up and first crossing the threshold of a lesson or a piece of engagement if there's something, if there's, if there's a juicy little carrot. Uh, carrots tend to work better than sticks. And we know from our experiments that you effectively want, what is it, five pseudo-randomized carrots to one stick, roughly, um, based on dolphin experiments and other lovely things like that. And of course, we have a wealth of data from games. We should use this. We should try and come up with better systems. But these systems are not fixes. They have to be, if you like, architecturally integrated with well-understood aims and objectives. What is education for? What should we be trying to teach these people? You know, is it really a good thing or a feasible thing that you should just collect more social data about people? Because that's what you've been told to do. And so, you know, I feel that people reached towards this sort of magic wand, and it's another form of ignorance and lack of interest in the, in, for me, the really important and fascinating psychology of, of engagement, of human-machine interaction, of reward engagement, and of doing this magical thing where the extrinsic and the intrinsic do not cancel each other out, but reinforce each other, where you, know, you don't just, you know, it's intr extrinsic, intrinsic motivation is all very well as a sort of yeah, everyone should just love learning. Well, yeah, great. Yeah, of course they should. Yes, and we should all, uh, you know, live long, happy lives and not smoke. But, uh, you know, we, we do need our nudges. We do need, you know, sort of robust, rigorous and interesting psychological systems. We can do a lot with, I would say, a digital layer, with getting technology to handle the stuff technology handles well, not with technology as solution. But I've seen a real, just a real kind of lack of ambition and vision on this. Where is it being done well? Is a sort of follow-up question for me. I, mean, I do think, you know, <laughs> you know, people like the military tend to be quite good at this kind of thing, because when it goes wrong, uh, dead people, um, and and they have massive budgets. Um, they've tended to be very good at human factors stuff, as it's sometimes called. And I think, you know, checklist manifesto, human manifa human factors, aviation, high precision and high performance, um, data-led engineering, um, high-level sports. Uh, you know, uh, some lovely companies, Quantum Black is a great data company in London who do stuff with F1, stuff with elite athletes. And there is a wonderful, wonderful marriage there of really good data and really good digital systems and big data and a really rich appreciation of human factors and the way that extrinsic and intrinsic motivations interact. And some of the lessons they tend to have are there is no one-size-fits-all solution, but like in good games, there are, there are systems that allow different people to have profiles and find their level find the motivations that work for them. We all need the extrinsics in our life, habit, environment, and so on. None of us acquires motivations that you are becoming you know, Mr. or Mrs. self-motivated. In a sense, we acquire or do not the life, the habits, the networks, the environment that enables us to flourish and pursue a task. So I'm, I'm optimistic when I look at, not, not the military, but you know, when I say it's, it's a lot of stuff that's done around these elite organization areas where they do take the science seriously, I would love to see that get through to social and democratic engagement to education. And, you know, education reformers, we're just leaving the Victorian era. So hopefully my grandchildren will begin to benefit from some of this. Hmm. I, I can't, I can't okay. let us leave the topic of games without asking you uh, one of my favourite questions because it enables me to go off and look at things afterwards. You, you, know, you spoke earlier about the, the, sort of the, the incredible sort of accessibility now of culture, the fact that we can contribute to it, not just consume it. And to me, you know, one sort of great expression to this is in gaming, which I think, you know, games are a really great cultural artifact that we don't, you know, we don't put them in art galleries or museums and things, but, you know, they are amongst some of the sort of richest environmental, you know, em environmental and, and, and sort of social contexts that, that we create and engage in for, for you know, um, in very large numbers. What's your favourite game? Which, is the, which, <laughs> is the, which are the best games, do you think, you know, sort of if you were going to put games in a gaming museum as, as, as artefacts mm -hmm. of culture, what well, would you put in? The, Bar the Barbican did a gaming exhibition, I which, it, which I gave some lovely little talks about games and things like that. And I, the trouble is there's autobiography here, isn't there? Because there's important games for me. When you yeah, go yeah. back and play them on emulation, you're like, oh, my goodness me, Wolfenstein 3D is awful. <laughs> oh, it's just dreadful. This is an embarrassment. Give me uh, Team Fortress. So I... I've always been a great lover, as it were, of what Shigeru Miyamoto has done and a lot of what his studio has produced in the Mario games 
in particular, but also some of the Legend of Zelda and the Link games, because I think they are sort of joyful and they balance freedom and constraint in a staggeringly impressive way. And as a studio, as a kind of team working, they have a very, very good iterative process where they don't release stuff until it's ready. Um, and at their best, you know, sort of Mario Galaxy are just beautiful works which are not too inaccessible. I also think, for me, there's things like the expressive potential of games like Dwarf Fortress, um, like perhaps even Minecraft, sort of sandbox games, and games where great complexity arises from s relatively simple rule sets and environments with what you might call beautiful scenes, where it's not too tightly joined together and you can bend and flex it and mod it to yourself. I mean, I'm most excited of all by, I suppose, the sort of modding community and what people do. I used to make what were called dot MUD or MUD files for the Doom games back in the day when ID or ID software released those. And I think yeah. if you look at the trouble is a lot of this is third, you know, it's first person shooter stuff, which which turns a lot of people off and for good reason. Whereas I think a lot of the, you know, if you look at Nebacula Drop and what came out of that and what some of the sort of physics bending games. Um, I find those very interesting. I give you a very long answer. Personal favourites, but absolute personal favourites for silly reasons. I love tower defence games. I always used to play real-time strategy games. I was big into Warcraft, Frozen Throne, and the original Starcraft mm. when it came out. And and I got too old, and my um, and my actions per minute is too low, and I I can't compete really with any of the good people. Tower defence games are for old people who used to play real-time strategy games. You have you know a map, so you have a complete knowledge. You have little towers, you upgrade them, you defend against waves of baddies. Pixel Junk Monsters, um, made by Pixel Junk, um, and it, it part of the Pixel Junk series for PlayStation 3. Two player co op, well, actually, two player co op games. So, I, really good two player co op games I adore. So, Pixel Junk Monsters and Portal 2, the two, my, two of my favourite ever proper co op games. That's th this is another long answer. That's okay. I think I know what I'm going to be doing this weekend, though. So <laughs> <laughs> trying I'm a bit out of date. I haven't. I have a young child, so yeah. I haven't let myself buy a PS4 or an Xbox, um, an Xbox yet, because if I did, I would then become a bad dad. Why? I have to wait till I can play with my son, and he's not old enough to be doing screens yet. Gosh, I thought you were going to say you have one, but it's locked in the cupboard at the moment. But I know locks on cupboards yeah, are not no. are not strong enough. Really, to get you away from it. No. So, okay, so let's move away then from from the idea of sort of digital environments as, as somehow I think they're sort of, you know, deep and fulfilling for sort of personal hedonic purposes, that their uses in, uh, you know, for other sort of extrinsic goals. And let's move then maybe on to the, the current book. Um, so live this book for those that, that haven't sort of seen their copies out there, I know, and I'm not here to publicize it. But it I is am. unusual. <laughs> in a way, it's, sorry, yeah, they told you I was going to, no. Um, I might mention it several times, though. Um, for those that haven't seen it, I mean, it's basically, it's, it, it's a manual for re-engaging yourself in life that doesn't involve digital devices in many ways, and for asking important questions about yourself that, that, that you think maybe we've got away from, mm. or in, engaged maybe in a slightly more trivial way, perhaps, just like you made for the Facebook yeah. point before. So tell me a bit more about that. Why do you think this was needed? So, so this, it, it, it wouldn't say the book happened by accident, but it emerged mm. out of my other work in doing talks, and it emerged, you know, partly autobiographically, about this idea to sort of, to try and re-engage in a more sort of discerning or critical way with digital devices. You know, it's not an anti-tech book, I, I very much hope. I had been feeling that, in a way, a lot of the sort of economic models out there around some of the most successful digital platforms, by no means all, undervalue human attention. They're ad-funded. Advertising's in a bit of a crisis at the moment, really, I think. Effectively, everyone, you know, it's a classic thing. People thought algorithms were magical, mystical, hand wavy stuff that would solve all their problems. And then it turned out what it actually did was get rid of their jobs um, <laughs> and not necessarily um, solve the problems in the way they thought. You know, so creative has been slightly hollowed out, but sort of procedural uh, ad sales are not quite what people thought they'd be, blah, blah, blah. But I feel that human attention is grossly underpriced by a lot of the tech that's out there at the moment. I feel there's going to be a correction. I feel there's a correction going on with a lot of new services and the way they operate. I feel the way people are using tech um, is changing to put themselves, their concentration, at more of a premium. I also feel when I do workshops and I work with companies, when I talk to people about tech, that people 
feel the need for sort of help in conducting these negotiations. I'm very interested, inspired by people like Jaron Lanier, who is a great technologist and author, and also a musician, and, um, and sort of kind of wonderful, inspiring, eccentric, who always sort of asked this question of technology, which is, you know, what would it take for me to you know, create content, to have an interaction that really belongs to me, that is not just a sort of lowest possible energy input passing of a digital buck that puts the imprimatur of my uniqueness upon it or whatever. And, and I think I have became worried that a lot of tech for a lot of people at the moment was turning all their time into the same kind of time that on the screens carried around, people perpetually avail had available from morning till evening on the same piece of flat real estate, the same services and everything they care ab cared about or worried about represented there. And that this is not nearly as good as tech could be, should be, or will be. This does not represent the pinnacle of our relationships with and through machines. This in some ways is based on accidental legacy or outdated models of what it means to have a really rich interaction with or through a machine. And that almost just as a shortcut to produce a, a, a book, a physical object that has, I hope, a bit of sort of beauty to it, was an interesting way of suggesting to people that they challenge their habits and that they don't switch off their phones totally. Don't, uh, digital detox is nonsense. You know, technology is not toxic. Um, that's just a silly thing to say, really, I think. Uh, it doesn't mean that time apart from tech cannot be immensely valuable. I just think that detox is, 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 a, is a dangerous metaphor that we can reach for much more accurate descriptions than this. And that particularly open questions have a greater premium value now than ever before because open questions are the ones to which search engines do not give good answers. You know, even Quora, God bless Quora, is very good at telling you what lots of other interesting people have said in response to that. And I think to give yourself substantial time to try to answer open questions, what is what matters to you? What is your definition of success? What makes you happy and why? When are you at your best? What are your strongest childhood memories? What, what would you like to ask of someone you respect? What favours? What would you do if you thought that you couldn't fail? What do you worry about? Or these open questions, I feel, are at more of a premium now because we are, you know, it, deluged wonderfully with the ability to ask, if you like, closed and precise questions of the corpus of shared knowledge and find out what has been said by others. And then, you know, to bring ourselves to that as richly as we can, getting in the habit of spending some time with your own open questions and with the time and the concentration to do yourself justice in them, it strikes me as a very good habit. And I did a lot of stuff through the School of Life in, in, in London, that, you know, sort of who I wrote a book, you know, very uh, sort of mainstream accessible, but, but a lot of other good people there who I've done events with who ask these kind of questions of people. And I've just felt there was a sort of a slight hunger for these, a slight need. And also people are getting obsessed with the sort of physical. And I, again, it's terribly boring when everyone is blaring on about sort of smell of libraries and books as if the best justification you can come up with for a physical book is that it's smelly. And I think, you know, you can just, you can do better than that. You can look into, you know, for example, how we read and realize that, you know, we use adaptations, adaptations within our own lifetimes, of the, the same, as it were, aspects of our brain we use for recognizing faces and objects. You know, language is only been around six, seven, eight thousand years. We don't, that's not enough evolutionary time for our brain to have, as it were, a Chomsky organ for the written word. So we are repurposing other visual centers. And that means that on screen design has to overcome a huge <coughs> number of challenges in terms of cognitive processing. It has to conjure up a geography from scratch. It has to deal with the fact that it has no, as it were, other forms of sensory engagement. It has to deal with the fact that it is inherently, um, you know, sort of, uh, ephemeral 
that you know it doesn't have the heft, the weight, the indelible dopamine. That it is many other things. That not only words come at you through most screens, but also you know pictures of cats. And who doesn't want to look at cats? It's a nice success story, really. And yeah. so you know, I I felt that we need to acknowledge these problems that technology has. And we need to get away from this horrific retrograde screens or books debate. It's not screens or books. That's that's just that's. What it is, frankly, is words or not words. That's the thing. It's are you someone who thinks richly with different kinds of time and attention through words, who uses them with confidence, who has this rich and structured way of approaching yourself and the world, or are you someone who is dealing in 10-word units, lots of pictures, and an awful lot of candy crush? And I think, you know, I want, I want there to be the richness that comes from having a having these different kinds of time and attention to bring to bear upon language and ideas and I want screens to be better and physical books to be used as part of the business of helping people to think more richly. I think that's a very noble aspiration. Um, I'm going to push back just on mm. uh, just on sort of one point. I mean, reading this, I mean, a it made me realise you know that I am the archetypal uptight Brit, you know, and th th it felt like a sort of you know uh, some of my you know West Coast American yes, friends asking very, me to loosen up a little it's very bit. Very Californian book, you know. Um, uh, so part of me think you know, well, is this book really about? Is this really prompted by technology, or actually is this prompted by other factors of? of our everyday lives you know we live in a sort of you know liberal post-liberal you know capitalist society riven by social inequality most of us are quite a long way away now from, from our sort of immediate family and you know social support networks are very different to what they used to be so you know th th there's something that seems very sort of nostalgic about the idea that maybe we used to be better at introspection better at asking ourselves these sorts of questions that somehow they were more easily prompted by our engagement maybe with arts or physical books and I mean is, is that so are we, are we laying too too much at the, at the sort of the, you know, are we blaming technology for too much? Uh, yeah, I, th I think in the sense you, you've, you, you've got me, it's fair enough that, you know, the, you see that you've got the digital hammer and then everything is the digital nail. Mm. Um, it, it is fundamentally a mistake to try and te t t take or address technology outside of society, outside of the human context. I think the thing that we call technology, if we give an account of it without society, is we very quickly up as, end up as a pure tech determinist where the entire story of human history is what tech has made us do. And the problem with that story, apart from the fact that it either ends in the singularity or in a big kind of boom, uh, is, I think, the fact that it ends where the interest begins. The interest being, OK, yeah, fair enough. Technology is, has profoundly deterministic effects upon us. But, you know, technology used how, used for what, in whose name, to what ends, with what vision of humanity, who owns, who, you know, the political questions and so yeah this is this is absolutely a set of questions I, d I hope it's not nostalgic because I wouldn't like to think that I'm looking back to the golden era of the mid 19th century when most women couldn't vote and so on and so forth and children worked in mines um, I'm not sort of nor am I weeping for the Edwardian era or indeed for the 1930s when I believe a few unpleasant political things happened so I, I think, however, it is a question, you know, perhaps naively, of trying to use what tools one can, trying to challenge habits, and, yeah, trying to get people there. There's a lot of explicitly political questions in there, and I don't think people are particularly deficient in compassion or empathy today, actually. I don't think we live in an age of narcissism. I think we live in an age where our narcissistic tendencies are very visible, um, and it would be nice to remind people that they have other tendencies. And I, I, I do think you, you, you sometimes need to begin from a position that isn't total disillusionment, that doesn't concede at the start the battles you wish to fight. And I find this with a lot of critics of, a lot of very eloquent critics of, if you like, technological collusion with the, either the military industrial complex or with global post-capitalism or whatever. Brilliant points are made, but they, in a sense, begin from a position of implied defeat. The implied defeat being that, well, yes, but broadly speaking, people that can collectively are stupid, weak-willed, and venal, and want to look at cats and porn. And I think, 
And I'm thinking perhaps of the, uh, in many ways, very brilliant polemical writer, Evgeny Morozov, who I've uh, argued with about this, who says very important things, and I think, and changes his position to his great credit and, and, and evolves. But I think there is to lose faith in people at the offset because of what you have seen them do is both understandable and very dangerous because then, in a sense, your diagnosis becomes a prognosis, becomes a death sentence. And so I, I would like to try to start from a different position. But yeah, I mean, we do, you've got to try and get people thinking outside of the boxes they're in. And tech is convenient, perhaps. I don't, I'm not a tech determinist. I, one of the, I wrote a book about sort of digital language, about new words, which is a very light book. I didn't, you know, I wrote it because I'm interested in it. I think it's quite fun. I also wrote it partly because it felt like a conversation starter. If I wanted to get a book which I can take to teenagers who have never thought about this kind of thing before, and I want to start a conversation, if I talk about where trolling and nerfing and ganking come from as words, Mm, people are going to prick up their ears, perhaps, who wouldn't prick up their ears if I said, well, I would really like to tell you about the etymology of pedagogus um, and get Greek on you. And I think, similarly, a conversation with people about their relationship with their phone can allow you then to talk about other things and hopefully not to make it, and to say, well, you know, actually, this is where we're starting our conversation. Um, and people, you know, people focus on it. Yeah, people focus. People get anxious about their phones and email, which is kind of hilarious, because this is th something we do to each other. And what they should be anxious about is why do we do these things to each other if we don't like them so much? And that is a much more interesting question. But talking about phones is perhaps a bit easier than saying, and say, who's a fan of post-structuralism? Which, uh, in a room like this, I'm sure I could learn with a lot of hands. <laughs> we could try that in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thinking a, more, a bit more about that book, I mean, I think it is a really interesting exercise just to sort of uh, unravel, if you like, the different words, the different jargon that we use to talk about certain sorts of activities. Um, what, what did you learn, though, from the larger project of doing that? I mean, you said actually it, was, it had a very clear reason for doing it, but actually did anything come out of it that surprised you when you were looking at all these... The, the language the, book. The language, yeah, the yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. to be honest, what came out of it was what I hope was a slight sort of dampening of, of, of perhaps a snobbery I didn't know I'd had was just a sense of, of the bigness of... So you go back 70 years, roughly, and that's when, for the first time in human history, the majority of the world's adult population became literate by, um, you know, sort of UN, WHO criteria. And then you go back now, you know, just sort of four or five years, and you find that the majority of the world's adult population are not only literate, but they're also active participants, as I said before, in the business of, of writing things down, in, in the construction of a written and a recorded and a debated culture. Now, and one of the answers to this, which I sort of hear on the radio, is people saying, yeah, but what are they writing? It's all nonsense. Rah, nonsense. And you think, well, you know, that's almost the least interesting thing you could say about it. And also, it's palpably not true. A lot of it may be fatic, a lot of it may be you know, sort of express it, kind of boo yuck arg type stuff. Um, but actually, it's sort of deeply, deeply, deeply interesting to be in a world when everyone is kind of speaking, and also in which one of the, one of the driving forces behind language change is becoming the act of typing onto a screen, into a screen context. You know, I was standing, admittedly, in Hoxton the other day behind someone in a queue, and they said, I'll have, a, um, I'll have a cold brew coffee. Coffee? I couldn't have cold brew coffee. And someone said, oh, uh, we haven't got cold brew, but I could make you, I don't know, a slow fat white with slow, flat white with soya or something like that. And the guy said, yeah, I guess that will have to do. Hashtag first world problems. And I thought, you've said that now, haven't you? <laughs> we can't take that. This is how we talk now. But I mean... That's, you know, lol. We say lol. We, it's sort of, and these are, this sounds really trivial. It sounds really trivial. But I think, you know, if you care about the dissemination of ideas, if you care about, you know, it was just, just glancing at a sort of a book that's been written about petitions and social change and ground up social change. Twitter is not automatically aligned with democracy, so we're all free, full stop. No, not at all. But it's just, we are learning, you know, we have this potential to sort of watch ourselves in action and to watch more people come on. You know, Clay Shirky was writing very excitedly about this. I'm perhaps less exciting than Clay, but it, 
it is extraordinary. It is extraordinary to have you know, this outpouring of words, to have this expansion of what we do with words, to do with how we perform ourselves to each other. It is an extraordinary thing to try and look at. It's an extraordinary opportunity. And saying it's extraordinary doesn't mean it's great, yay. It doesn't mean, and war will end, which is what people tended to say when the electric telegraph first crossed the Atlantic. Like, there can be no more war, because now we can hear a report of the people we're bombing. Yeah, that worked very well. But I, the bigness of this thing that we're going through, and of the mobile phone in particular, you know, the hum, humble and Nokia, 1100 and 3100 and now smartphones. There's more than one mobile phone account for every human being alive on the planet. And it impresses me most at the level of words and at the level of image macros, I guess, which is, you know, like words with cats. But there's something very big that if you care about words and ideas, it would be almost sort of absurd not to be interested in. Yeah. In a minute, I want to ask you what some of your favourite one, ones were, but I, I, I also want to ask where you think this is going. I mean, you know, there's a lot made for, you know, around the re most recent iOS release and the new range of emojis that came with it. Mm. Um, and, you know, at the same time, as I think it's really fascinating to see, as you say, how text speak is migrating into mm. spoken language. Do you think, you know, is it going to be something interesting to look at our graphical expressions yeah. like of sentiments and emotions and relationships? With a single the word, where's it all going question? Not, but yeah. This is the one you wish people wouldn't turn off the video. Sorry, and I didn't tell you I was going to ask this earlier. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, no. I mean, you can't go through a tech talk without quoting William Gibson saying things about the future. I could hardly bring myself to say it again, but you know, this, this idea that the future is unevenly distributed, that, you know, I think. The more interesting corollary to that is that if the future is unevenly distributed, then somewhere else right now, our future is going on. And when it comes to the fine art of prediction, which generally is about as good as drunken monkeys throwing pins at a wall, you have to try and look very carefully indeed at what some people are actually doing right now. And with visual and textual communications, the text message, total accident, mm -hmm. it's, a, you know, it's a control frequency reserved, 160 characters, 140 message plus 20 control characters, reserved for telecommunications companies to test their system. Fair enough. Selfies, basically an accident. People were trying to get video calling going as a thing. It wasn't taking off. And it was sort of realized communally, you know, that the static photo was in some ways a more expressive marriage of control and restriction and expression. Um, emoticons, emoji, I mean emoticons go back to Scott Fallman, I guess in 1982, uh, but emoji were Japanese ultra competitive mobile phone networks wanting to have something new because it was so highly competitive around the sort of, you know, sort of uh, early days of, of, of data signals, and somebody came up with 172 uh, little little faces in, in the sort of um, spirit almost of kind of uh, sort of bitmap kanji. And that became a thing. So when one says what next, I mean, I think you have to look to what people are trying to do rather than what is theoretically or technologically possible. And, you know, when I, in terms of the language, in terms of what's possible, you know, the emo emoticons which were all regulated by the one body. I love that, the fact yeah. that, oh, yeah, because um, it's not ICANN. It's um, the da, 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 I can't believe I'm forgetting this, you, who, who regulate ASCII, the, the body who regulate ASCII. Ask, what's that? Yes, I think it is. It, 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 it's inter, is it international standards or is it? Anyway, so I think we're on we're ASCII 6.0 specification now. And in order for emoji to leave Japan and become global, they had to be written into standard international character specification, which means they come under the single ICANN-like not-for-profit international regulatory body. So all the emoji have to just be done through the one central not-for-profit thing. There's no, that's what makes them a language. And I think this is what makes a language. I suppose this is what I'm, what I'm saying. This is what makes something linguistic, you know, image macros. And I, th you know, I think some of the next stuff is language blending, really, because I think that the there is this greater and greater and greater need for what's sometimes called social steganography, the hiding in plain sight, the use of multiple registers, 
sort of privacy as control over layers of meaning and frames of reference rather than privacy as you can't have my data because everyone's got your data anyway. Um, and I think linguistic blending is, is really interesting because it's something I see emerging, but, you know, particularly in China, Korea, um, but also um, in South America, perhaps these are the, and Turkey is very interesting there, as I'm aware of. And I think this is interesting because with it comes sort of, trans, it, it ties into the sort of transnational or franchise political movements where the hashtags and the political movements and the ideas behind them are sort of not of a, are themselves like a kind of expressive language. And actually, the hashtag of your politics is a method of, is to do with identity, is to do with self-expression, is to do with allegiance. And politicians have been, like Beppe Grillo, have been very good at sort of mobilizing this kind of stuff to the point of election. And then they're like, and now I'm in Parliament and nothing works, and it's exactly the same as before. And, you know, we've got the Estonias of the world trying to do things a little differently and doing some very exciting things. And all this stuff... I like it because it's new, new ways of sort of talking about identity and politics and social groupings that are to do with, you know, sort of a linguistic blending that are perhaps products of this massive linguistic melting pot with, with its sort of transnational elements. And you could say that new insularities are becoming, you know, sort of part of this pattern as well, that those that people are becoming more insular. I'm coming these enormous long answers, but, um, but I, so I'm very excited by linguistic blending mm. and sort of and the next evolution of hashtag politics into something more sophisticated and joined up, and in when it actually begins to have impacts upon the mechanisms of government rather than just the mechanisms of getting people to put you in government. See, I guess such a good answer. I put you on the spot. Yes. Um, can I thank our wonderful public intellectual speaker, Tom <laughs> Chatfield, of superbly entertaining, superbly thank interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's great to have you. Thank you.